next we have Eduardo Medina uh, with the effects of. Oh. <laughs> All right, who did it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Eduardo, <laughs> with um, the effects. Well, you can read. The title. <laughs> I'm sorry, Eduardo. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eduardo, and um, I'm a PhD student at the Open University, uh, supervised by Emma Sayer. And my PhD is looking at how different tree species affect soil carbon dynamics under climate change. But today, I'm going to present you um, one of my experiments looking at how um, out of sink litter inputs affect temperate forest soils um, dynamics. I don't really know how to work this thing, so it'll happen a little back and forth. Yeah. OK. Um, and I just wanted to tell you a bit about how the idea behind this experiment. I went out to the field because I was hoping to set up some litter traps to catch litter for a completely different experiment. And I did this during summer, hoping to catch autumn litter. But when I got there, for some of these species, about 80% of the litter was already gone. And what happened was that uh, two weeks before that, there was a storm, and there was really strong wind, and it just took down most of the litter. So I just started thinking about how I, it, it was, there were a lot of interesting things. First, that it didn't happen for all of the species. And second, that I just started thinking, how would this affect soil carbon dynamics? Um, so I wanted to design an experiment to look into this. And I think this is really relevant because um, forest soils are a large repository of terrestrial carbon. However, we're still paying a bit more attention to above ground biomass, underestimating what happens in the soil. So any kind of research that we can do on that, I think <coughs> is really interesting. Uh, so when I started to thinking about what to do and how to do it, I just went all the way back to the most basic idea of the carbon cycle, which is just how plants uh, uptake carbon, uh, store it in the bio biomass, and then some of it enters the soil as litter or root exudates. Microbial processes happen, lit litter decompositions happen, and then some of this carbon is released back to the atmosphere as CO2. But these... Um, um, cycle can be altered and that's exactly what I wanted to pay attention to and the alteration that I wanted to look at <coughs> was storms um, uh, storm is one of the extreme events that are likely to increase under climate change and they will affect forests it, they will affect temperate forests in fact storms are the most threatening um, extreme event um, for temperate forest. And we know nearly nothing about how they will affect soil car carbon dynamics and very little about how to predict how likely they will become. So I just wanted to create an experiment that would allow me to see how really strong <laughs> storms or strong winds that will cause earlier inputs into the soil will affect soil carbon dynamics. There is some literature, well, there is literature on, on the effects on the storms, but they focus more on really, really severe storms, and it, it, it is looking into more um, wood material and er, wood material decomposition and wood material addition, and it sort of ignores <coughs> weaker storms that could also have an important effect. And then I also wanted to include a, a, a tree species component, just because we're talking about litter, and litter is different with different species, differs in carbon concentrations, in the composition rates, and in, in concentration of nutrients. And I just wanted to, to see whether this would have an effect in what I wanted to look at. Um, so the aim of my experiment was to explore the effects of out of sync litter additions and then to see whether there was a species um, effect, more focused on litter quality effect on these processes. Um, and to do this, I designed a, a long-term field experiment in Whiteham Woods in Oxford, and in which I selected stands, four by four meter stands, and I decided to work with ash and oak, which, which were two of the most um, <coughs> 
common species in the area that I was working, and I also include a mixed species um, treatment. And I selected my stands based on the median density of those species, so three or more adult trees of those species. And those are the pictures. Those two pictures are when I initially installed my colors. And then you can see that it, they kind of have been clearly mainly under the influence of those species with the old one being surrounded mostly by old litter and the ash one the same way. And then for this, I did litter additions uh, to some of them green litter during summer and to some others um, senescent litter during autumn. I just wanted to see this differences in respiration rates and whether they would affect uh, soil properties they will cause some variation from initial to final so soil properties. <coughs> um, and th so the first thing I did was having my initial soil properties um, just to see whether they, they were actually different based on tree species. And I ran this uh, principal component analysis and I think it is quite nice to see how, um, where's the point I think, right here how um, when clustering by species, you already get to see some differences. And the most interesting thing, I think, is um, to see how the, the mixed treatment sort of covers it all because there is a lot of variation with it. And this is something that I find really important to consider before uh, establishing field experiments because, as we know, um, tree species is one of them, one, one very important uh, Regulator, what I say, also <laughs> properties. Um, the next thing that I wanted to look at was uh, differences in decomposition rates for green versus senescent litter. So I did um, field the decom litter decomposition experiments, and results show clearly that for all of my treatments. The, the, the rates of decomposition will be higher on green litter. Uh, this is in um, percentage of mass loss per day, which is already interesting because the, that will have a, a, an important effect on the rate of input into the soil. And um, I also wanted to get to know a bit better the quality of my litter, so I ran some uh, litter analysis and I I think one of the most important things to look at in here is the percentage of carbon which in my green litter is about 10 to 12 percent higher than <coughs> in the senescent litter so already knowing that my green litter had um, higher carbon percentage and was going to decompose faster I was expecting to see something <laughs> happening. And this is my respiration data. And I, I'm just presenting here peak respiration data for my two li liter additions. So on the top on green is the peak respiration data when I added my green liter. And down here is the peak respiration when I added my senescent liter. And as expected, when I added green, green respiration was higher. When I added senescent, senescent respiration was higher. But I think the important thing to look at in here is the difference in the magnitude of the response with the response uh, after green litter addition being kind of up to two times stronger than with senescent litter addition. Um, this is a bit of a work in progress, so I don't have all of my um, results now, but I wanted to show you my microbial, um, microbial biomass data because it shows something completely different to what I was expecting. I was expecting my soil that respired higher to have a greater microbial biomass, and it showed the opposite for at least ash and oak and no difference for mixed soil. This 
it could be many reasons. First of all, I'm, I, I'm doing soil color, so that it's not completely I isolated for what happens outside. So probably my the the rest of the litter hap uh, outside is kind of emasculating my results. But I have to look into this in more detail, but I think this is really interesting. Um, yeah, so I, as a summary, I just wanted to say that it is important to look into um, inputs of green litter that happen early in the year, not only because it's, it, to me at least, it sounds kind of cool, but also because they are happening, and they're happening often, and they're likely to happen even more often, and we're just not accounting for it. And that I, and and they are they are resulting in a lot of carbon that is being lost <laughs> of the system sent out back to the atmosphere, and um, we're kind of not paying attention. And it is also interesting to look at species. However, in the species that I selected, at least for uh, soil respiration, they didn't really show differences. So respiration rates were the same for all my treatments. Um, and I ran um, mixed model analysis on these, and the composition rates are, and the concentration of carbon in litter seem to be the, the variables that are um, controlling respiration rates, which is, I think, quite cool. And that's it. Thanks a lot for that, Eduardo. Mm -hmm. That's uh, something I hadn't really considered, the green inputs before. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any questions for him? Okay. Uh, if I understood correctly, are you putting the green and semester inputs in at different times of year? Yeah. So do you have any seasonal confounders then when you're looking at that? But perhaps the microbes are more active at one time of year than the other anyway. That could be. But I don't... Because of the nature of the mm -hmm. design, I, I couldn't measure microbial communities or activity mm -hmm. within my experiment because I would not be able to measure soil respiration then. So I don't have data on that. I can only do initial and final comparison. But there is, there is definitely a seasonal um, effect on what I'm looking at that I need to, to explore a bit more. Anyone else? I guess on, on the same lines as that last question, I mean, are you controlling for soil temperature or anything like yeah. that when you're taking yeah. your measurements? Yeah. And, and just because I'm curious, is there, is there any data on how much green leaf input happens in forests like this and, and how variable it is from year to year? No, no, no. <laughs> there is not a lot of information on this. As, as I said, there, people do explore storms as as a thing, but all the research has been directed to really severe and dramatic storms, and and storms like the one I witnessed when I when I went out ha happened happen often, and especially in the highlands in the UK, they they do cause um, out of sea litter inputs more than once a year, I would say, but but it's not something being looked at. Interesting area for further study then. Thank you very much for that. We are just running a couple minutes ahead of time, so I think we'll just wait one minute before we start. You're still welcome to come forward, <laughs> but just in case anyone's coming in from another session, we don't want to get too far out of sync. So now's your chance if you're standing at the back to Find one of the open seats. <laughs> just about back on schedule, so we'll go ahead and start. Up next we have John Crawford talking to us about the limitations of extrapolating soil processes across scales. So, John. Hi, um, I'm John. Um, I'm a PhD student at Lancaster University uh, with my supervisors Emma Sayer and Nick Ossel. 
Um, I'm working as part of MSA's Forest Prime project, which is funded by the European Research Council um, and is exploring uh, priming effects in uh, forest ecosystems. Um, today I'm going to present some work that I've, um, work that I've been uh, doing on um, how we can compare soil microcosms and small-scale lab experiments up to larger, large-scale field experiments. And I'll discuss, discuss some of the limitations when extrapolating soil processes across scales. Um, so scaling is a common issue across ecology. Um, artifacts from experimental scale can confound results, um, and extrapolating across any experimental scale or environmental scale can lead to over, over or underestimation of um, the results and the effect that we're looking at. Um, so small scale studies are really, really useful, and it's the, I want to be very clear about this, small scale studies are very, very useful. They provide a really good tool as a reductionist approach where we can reduce variability or attempt to reduce variability. Um, we can increase the replication and the treatments within experiments. They're cheap, easy to maintain, um, and fundamentally they can give us a really detailed understanding of mechanisms that we, we might be interested in. However, we, we must remain uh, critical over whether observed mechanisms are comparable to real world conditions especially if we want to use the, any of this data um, in any kind of modelling efforts, whereas error that might be, or artefaction from, from the scale um, might lead to um, big differences when we try and scale up. Um, so plant soil interactions are really, really important um, or really, uh, really relevant for this um, due to the, am amount, the amount of variability that occurs um, in, soil, in, soil, in soils. Um, and priming effects are a really good example of this. Um, so priming effects occur when inputs of labile uh, organic carbon stimulate the release of microbial mineral oh, uh, when priming effects occur when labile organic carbon stimulates the microbial mineralization of so soil organic carbon. Um, so this is really important under climate scenarios where we might in increase primary uh, increase productivity in forests and increase the input of car carbon in the form of leaf litter into the soils. Um, and as a feedback, if this then causes an extra release of, of, of carbon from the soils, this, this can potentially have a pretty big significant effect across ecosystems. Most of what we know about priming effects is derived from lab-based experiments, um, especially a mechanistic understanding of priming effects. Um, and a lot of these are very artificial in their design with artificial quantity and quality of substrate emissions. So whether it's an annual litterfall or over an annual litterfall input applied in one go, or very, very simple uh, substrates that are applied to the experiments. So when we look at, look at some of the literature and some of the, some of the data that has been produced on priming effects, um, this, you won't be able to see this, it's a lot smaller than I was expecting the screen. Um, we can see a range of experiments here um, and a, a range of different substrate types, um, but there, there's this trend between the priming effect that's measured within an experiment and the size of the experiment, which are these two axes on here. Um, and when we split this data set down into uh, lab, lab experiments, and which are the, the yellow boxes, and um, field experiments, which are the blue boxes, we see this um, increase in measured priming response in lab experiments when compared to field experiments. So really trying to answer this question, I wanted to first look at what, what we might be doing to soil in, in our small scale lab, lab incubation studies. So initially I looked at whether um, soil properties recover to field-like conditions post sieving and drying. So this is a really homogenized, really kind of mucked up soil that we've got here. And we want to see whether it recovers to anything like the field. Um, so soils were collected from four sites and I conducted soil analysis on the fresh soil properties. I then sieved and air dried the soils and then re-wet them back up to field water content and incubated them for 60 days uh, with destructive sampling throughout the incubation. And again, I apologize, you probably won't be able to see the graphs in that much detail, but um, on the left here I've got some microbial biomass data, and so we can see this big decline in the microbial biomass after processing and homogenization, um, which doesn't recover back to field-like conditions after 60 days. You can see at 30 days we start to see some increase, but this is very, very variable, and this is driven by massive variability between the four sites that I sampled from. So not only are we seeing this big decline, but it's also not consistent between sites. <coughs> And the same is true for some nitrogen data here, which I've got ammonium and nitrate uh, data. And 
we can see much inc a big increase in the variability um, of these uh, of these nu uh, nutrients, and um, a big big increase within the within the microcosm. So we're by, by homogenizing the soil and disaggregating it, we're, we're flushing the system with a lot of uh, extra resource that will affect the soil, which has the potential to drastically affect the functioning of the soil in our experiments. I then wanted to break this down a bit more and compare between different types of <coughs> microcosm experiments. So it's very hard to actually define what a microcosm is because there's a uh, kind of lack of consistency within methods of how people perform uh, kind of soil incubations. So I separated out fresh intact cores with fresh sieved soil, and then dry intact and dry sieved soil that was then re-wet back up to um, the same water content. Um, and in this experiment, I applied substrate to these uh, four pretreatments, although the data is not finished yet, um, and it's not ready yet. But I'm just going to present some some results from ion exchange membranes that I used and different ion exchange rates within these four um, types of microcosm setups. Um, so here, the Fi, which is the kind of the blue blue bar, is the fresh intact core, and um, with the other cores being uh, the other other boxes being um, the the other uh, types of microcosm. And we can see a big increase again in the um, available in the, the nitrogen trans ion exchange rates uh, within these different types of cores, and also a much bigger increase in the variability. So we think by homogenizing we might be reducing variability, but it it seems that we might be kind of releasing hot spots within the different cores that we take and increasing the variability between our replicates. And this pattern followed on um, a range of other ions that, that I, I measured using these, these uh, resin membranes. Um, this is just a range of them, but the, set, the pattern is the same um, throughout these. So as part of Forest Prime, which is the project that I'm working on, um, we wanted to then take this information about the effects on soil properties and do a direct scale comparison of a priming effect experiment. Um, so we had a nested design across experimental scales where we had field plots where we applied three basic litter treatments, uh, which was zero litter, one times litter, so a, a kind of control litter, and then a double litter to simulate increased uh, productivity in the system. These were applied in the field via raking, um, and we sampled from the field plots, we took the soil and the litter from each plot, and we scaled it down um, in experimental scales right down to an 80 gram microcosm experiment. Uh, we measured the same things at each scale using the same methods um, with the principal um, variable that we measured being uh, soil respiration. So here's some initial data from this comparison um, where we've got micros microcosms on the right and um, over to field on the left. And we can see that in the microcosm study there's an increased uh, response ratio um, when comparing the zero litter and the double litter to the control litter. Um, in the microcosm study compared to the field study. So we seem to be increasing the, the treatment effect um, in our small lab incubations. Um, and then following on from this, uh, we wanted to calculate the priming effect. So this is an initial calcula calculation of priming effects ne next, which we're going to validate with some, um, with some 13C labelling that we've, we've done as well. Um, but here's the initial peak priming response across the three scales. And you can see there's an increase um, in the priming response in the microcosm study when compared to field study. Um, and this follows the same pattern that we saw, well, a similar pattern that we saw in the, in the literature when we see that the scale does seem to be doing something to the, to the priming effect that we're, that we're, me we're measuring. So in summary, um, changes in soil properties do not recover to feel like conditions after sieving and air drying. Um, and soil function may be altered um, in homogenized soils, whether these are sieved or dried. Um, and overall, we see this increase in the treatment effect in, in microcosm studies. Um, and the, the, the kind of the mechanism that we're looking at, the priming effect, uh, may be overestimated if we take data from microcosm studies. I think it's really important to, 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 to kind of clarify that the, these microcosm studies are vital for understanding the detailed mechanisms of the processes we're looking at. But if we want to really understand the relevance of uh, phenomena such as priming effect in the real world, we really need to try and design um, nested studies and try and make our um, incubations as realistic as possible. Um, thank you. Questions? Thanks very much for that, John. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, but I, I was just wondering, do you think your 
big difference in the climbing effect in the microcosms compared to the mesocosms and the field. Uh, so I'm assuming that you didn't grow plants in the microcosms. Nope. So this is a do you think it's down to the soil treatment? Or do you think it's down to the fact that there's a plant there? This is something that I really wanted to look at, but I didn't kind of have time to look at the effect of plant. But in, in our kind of microcosm studies, very rarely do people use, incorporate plants in them, um, as it adds a lot of complication to interpreting results. Um, and I think that's a, you know, with, especially for things like priming, it's a plant soil interaction, and we're missing the plants in a lot of, in a lot of our experiments. Are you going to do that? I haven't got time in my PhD, but we'll see. Perhaps you'd like to offer him a postcard. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, technical question. If I would like to keep some soil samples for future analysis, mm -hmm. what would you suggest? Is that we are drying it in the freezer? Well, this is uh, this is the thing. Like, it, we, we we do these processes because it makes it convenient and it means we can do more science on on a greater range of soils. And if we only if we only did it on fresh soil, we would you know we would lose a lot of a lot of the potential for experiments. Um, I think if you are comparing between like doing a comparative study on where you treat your soil exactly the same. It can still answer questions about mechanisms, but you've got it. I think you've got to be um, just quite. I, I just think we need to be more critical of what we're doing. Um, and I, I haven't explored freezing fresh soil, uh, but that's something I, I imagine that would affect a lot of processes as well, quite significantly. Uh, following on from that kind of question, um, have you looked at all at storage, uh, effects of storage on? I haven't, no. Uh, there, there is some data about that and archiving soil and, and having to use um, later, but I haven't looked at that. Do you have one question? I'm curious on the verification you managed to achieve between the different levels of uh, experiments. So your microcosm is clear, you're able to have much higher level verification. Yep. What was the scale you had for the, like, between uh, that last graph you showed? Mm -hmm. What was the difference between them? They were at the, the, same, the same level. So I took, I, I sampled from the field plots and use the soil from the field plots in the same block design. So from each block and from each plot, just to try and make sure that it's the same level. And the same number of more samples? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more questions for John? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
additional reinforcements have arrived. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just having wide screen. Oh, it's just a PDF. Yeah. Okay, I'll try over. And that has almost perfectly brought us back onto schedule. <laughs> so up next, without further ado, is Sam Jones telling us about some non-destructive measurements from soil water. Hi, Thanks, Sam. I'm Sam. I'm a postdoc at NRA Bordeaux, and I'm working on an ERC-funded project awarded to Lisa Wingate, looking at ways to estimate carbon and hydro's activity in soil using oxygen isotopes and the CO2 analog carbon sulfide. And the idea is we constrain the variability in soils and then try and upscale massively. So the last talk was pretty relevant for us, generally speaking. Carbonic anhydrase, I'm sorry it's a bit small, but they're a group of metalloenzymes typically centered around a zinc ion, which catalyzed the hydration of aqueous carbon dioxide. And these enzymes are expressed by, in all domains of life and are typically associated with processes where organisms need to control the availability of carbon dioxide or carbonate. For example, CO2 concentration mechanisms used by plants, algae, and cyanobacteria. However, we don't really understand CA activity in soils. And this is noteworthy because CA, acti CA activity, due to the fact that oxygen isotopes are exchanged between carbon dioxide and soil water during hydration, represents the key uncertainty in using atmospheric budgets of the oxygen isotope composition of CO2 to partition gross terrestrial carbon fluxes to and from the atmosphere. So, this is a method to talk, unfortunately. Traditionally, the assay for CA, um, I don't know why I have a little hand. That's <laughs> 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 good, that's from Stone. So, traditionally, the um, assay for CA involved measuring the rate of hydration in terms of a set pH change occurring in a low temperature buffer solution. And then we express the activity um, by the difference between the solution with an enzyme and one without an enzyme. The problem with applying this to soils is we have to be able to extract the enzymes from the bog soil, which is difficult. And also in terms of the global modeling situation, um, the hydration rates we estimate are under pretty non-realistic conditions. With this in mind, soil studies, I'm sorry for all the equations, Soil studies tend to focus on inverting models which describe the O18 mass balance in soil to isolate the hydration term, this rate, term, this rate term. And they do this using measurements of fluxes and the ambient composition concentration of CO2. But we also need to know this tiny term here, which you might not be able to see, which is delta ek. And delta ek is the isotopic composition of CO2 in equilibrium with the soil pool, well, the water pool, where hydration occurs. So in practice, we tend to take flux measurements and then go dig a hole and take depth resolved soil samples. Then we physically extract the water and analyze it for its isotopic composition. Then we relate that value to delta rec. Again, another problem. Firstly, we get strong gradients due to evaporation in the surface of soils in the O18 composition. And we don't have any a priori information telling us at what resolution to sample. And secondly, if anyone's ever actually tried to extract a complete water sample from soil, it's really difficult. You have fractionation. It, it's a pain. So with this in mind, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's simple really. We've been playing with the idea that if we define our mass balance models at two conditions which only differ in terms of the isotopic composition of ambient CO2, so delta A, we attain a set of equations which might let us simultaneously <coughs> solve the isotopic composition of the water pool and the rate of exchange only from gas flux measurements. So we take two equations, two steady states, and make one simultaneous equation system. So this is what we're playing with. So to test the idea, we um, conducted laboratory incubations of air dry soil. We labeled with one of three different composition waters. So we have three different water treatments. And this achieved um, in the isotopic composition of water we physically extracted gave us three different treatments with about minus 7 per mil, minus 4.3, and about minus 0.8 per mil of smoke. 
We also play with the sensitivity of our approach to the composition of um, ambient CO2 we're using. And I know this is really small, I'm sorry, but essentially each chamber we sequentially expose to one of three different CO2 sources using a gas supply system. So we have delta ray, which is the stuff from sitting down in CO2, with a medium value. Um, so here, you can't really see, but these little squares for the bypass line in our incubation system has a value of about minus 15 per mil, um, BPDB, BPDBG. Then we have delta ray high, which is actually a compressed cylinder atmospheric air, which has a value of about minus four per mil. And then delta ray low, which is another pure CO2 system that we dilute, which has a value of about minus 25 per mil. And by taking alternative measurements of a bypass in the chamber line, we use a isotope ratio infrared spectrometer to measure the flux in the ambient conditions that our chamber sees. This looks horrible, but it's super simple. This just summarizes what I've just said. We have three water treatments, each with six replicates. Each chamber is exposed to three different ambient compositions of CO2, where we measure fluxes in the ambient conditions. And then for each combination of these three gases, we calculate model solution. So for delta A low and delta A med, we calculate their exchange rate and the composition of the water pool. The same for delta A medium and high and high and low. This is just to see if our solutions are sensitive to the actual gases we're putting in. <laughs> so results. I only want you to take one thing away from this, and I know it's really small. But these are essentially, for those two combinations, we have a dual steady state approach. So we have the delta A high and low, high and medium, medium and low. And then the symbols represent the water treatments. So we have the minus seven to zero, going from the circles, triangles, and squares. And we've plotted the water composition we estimate against the hydration rate. And all I want you to take away from this is that our approach, graphically speaking, is essentially constrained by the model response for the two single steady states. So in this case, the solid lines are the atmospheric cylinder, and the dashed lines are the low dilution. And the intersection of these two models is the solution we get. This is possibly a bit easier. So if we're looking at hydration rates, we see we have a relatively consistent estimates across the different treatments. So the, these three pairings of the water treatments, and then the colors of the combinations of gases. And we see that we have rate estimates which are between four and seven times greater than the theoretical uncapitalized rate. And this means, of course, that we presume we have carbonic anhydrase activity. We also see that some combinations are better than others. And particularly among water treatments, the red box plots for the high and low combination give us our best position. But we have this question about accuracy, right? At the moment, we're just a model in and got an answer. And this is why we labeled with water at the start. So we have something we can externally get back to by another method. And of course, a good idea becomes super complicated really quickly. So here I've plotted the model estimate of the water pool composition minus the value that we physically attract, um, extract from the soil. And we see that we have a pretty consistent offset of about three per mil, well, one to three per mil. And this means that we have some questions to answer. Because normally we assume that we're in equilibrium with the bulk soil water pool, but we don't really have any evidence for that. There are obviously different water pools within the soil matrix. You have water bound to soil surfaces, microbial water, biofilm, and then the question of internal versus external carbonic anhydrase. So this is sort of where we are now, in fact. We need to try and explain this offset and hopefully get a better understanding of actually what is happening within the soil matrix. Sort of by way of summary, going back to the original isotopic method with a single steady state, I took the results for the atmospheric cylinder and computed the model response and tried to estimate the hydration rate based on the values of soil water we physically extracted and the water we irrigated with. The important thing to note here is this is a log scale. So this is for one of the water treatments, and the high and low combination we used estimated that the rate was about 6.4, with a deviation of 
six times greater than the uncatalyzed rate. If we do use this method, the results are between zero and 30,000 times the uncatalyzed rate, which is obviously <laughs> terrifying if someone's trying to upscale with a model to explain what constrained GPP, for example. So I guess what I want to say is that whilst I still have questions, we have a quite conservative approach, which seems to give relatively reasonable results, but we still need to explain this offset we see. And hopefully by doing this, then we can actually get some ecological data and try and explain how sea activity varies, and then maybe have a reasonable estimate for global models. Uh, thanks for listening. A little plug for my office mate who works on the same project, who has a poster this afternoon looking at carbonyl sulfide fluxes, which were also mediated by carbonic anhydrase, and some references. If anyone wants to ask me about the lasers and isotopes later, go for that as well. Cheers. Thanks for that. Certainly uh, a few more equations than the other presentations we've seen this afternoon. There were more people. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes, so there's a recent paper in Biogeoscience by Hein and Schneider, and they essentially look at the difference between the bulk soil water pool and soil water associated with organic surfaces. And there is a, about a two per mil difference between these pools in the right direction. So it's possibly the case. But then we get into the tricky situation that presumably you have, well, if we assume microbes are near the surface of minerals and particles, we have uncatalyzed, potentially, hydration occurring in the free water, and a catalyzed mm. hydration happening at the surface in a different water pool. Yeah, so there's potentially multiple solutions. We've run some of this data through a, um, a dynamic model as well, and it seems to agree that we have an offset and it's real. But maybe six months, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Sam? I know, it really would help. There we go. Sorry, <laughs> right, uh, up next we have Emenga Alapodag talking to us about the impacts on soil physio physiochemical properties following additions. So, thank you, Emenga. <laughs> Um, my research is looking at algae as a sustainable soil condi conditioner, um, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Sheffield. Uh, so as you all know, soil degradation results from intensive and unsustainable farming and land management practices in order to produce enough food to feed a growing population. Um, last year, a research group from Cranfield University estimated the amount of quantifiable soil degradation be approximately 1.2 billion pounds um, a year, and this value was mainly linked to the loss of soil organic matter, which is important in um, holding soil particles together to give it a structure and um, creating macroaggregates. And um, the a loss of soil organic matter will mean um, that the soil itself is vulnerable to agents such as wind and water erosion, as you know, and um, that leads to um, um, when. Uh, it leads to a reduction in water infiltration um, if the soil creates a hard physical crust. And um, this uh, leads to higher surface runoff and flooding and erosion, and the whole cycle continues. Um, the motivation for my project st stems from this same issue of soil degradation, um, where in order to compensate for the loss in productivity, high inputs of inorganic, fer inorganic fertilizers are added onto agricultural land, and some of, which is taken up, some of it is taken up by plants, and the rest, which is not um, um, bound to clay minerals or organic matter in the soil ends up leaching into nearby waterways, causing eutrophication, which is normally seen as an ecological hazard. However, my project is looking at 
um, this as an environmental opportunity where um, we're attempting to recycle this algae biomass in, and replenish it back onto the s and add it back onto the soil in order to replenish the key soil characteristics that have been lost as a result of soil degradation, namely um, the aggregate stability as well as the nutrients, and ultimately to see whether these effects are translatable to crop growth and yield. Um, so as some of you, in case some of you don't know, algae are um, plant-like organisms. They're usually photosynthetic and they represent different phylogenetic groups and are found almost everywhere from the soil itself to freshwater and marine ecosystems. And here only a few, um, only a few of the species are shown and these are the ones with the most agricultural and industrial significance where um, the cyanobacteria from the cyanophyta group are used in many parts of Asia where they're able to fix atmospheric nitrogen and supply rice crops with um, organic nitrogen. And um, the green algae and as well, the green algae is used a lot in industrial processes as a nutrient scavenger in, in terms of it helps to clean the wastewater by um, taking up nitrogen and phosphorus. And the seaweeds, that's the macroalgae, um, are then generally used in um, coastal areas in, um, uh, as a fertilizer where they just harvest it and apply it directly onto the soil to supply nutrients. So, um, so the use of algae um, is not really new. However, there hasn't been any comparison among the different phylogenetic groups. And additionally, with the exception of cyanobacteria, the mechanisms for the ability to increase soil fertility have remained largely unexplored. So um, in order to do this, I conducted a, um, an experiment where I was looking at the different algae groups and looking at the effects in restoring these key soil functions, particularly when applied to the soil as dry biomass. And um, algae, when growing in nutrient environments, um, assimilate nitrogen and phosphorus, as I said previously, because these two elements are limiting to the growth. And they're able to um, increase in biomass as a result. So therefore, applying them back onto agricultural land would likely improve the soil physical chemical properties. So um, for the experimental design, I conducted a greenhouse experiment first using um, peas, and um, where I added five different species of algae. Uh, the first two are microalgae, Arthrospira patensis, or spirulina, which some of you might know as like a superfood, um, chlorella, um, and three um, seaweeds, um, Palmaria palmata, representing the rhodophyta group, a red algae, and both brown algae, Saccharina latissima, and Ascophyllum nodosum. And these were applied in three application rates, to also, which were derived from the literature. And this was also to test whether the effects were seen across, whether the increased effects were seen as you added more fertilizer. And um, the soil was taken from a, a field in Yorkshire, which was subject to long-term cropping. And the methods of analysis were um, just the typical ones, the total, car the total nutrients as well as the available and for soil physical properties, the water holding capacity and aggregate stability and the plant properties that were measured with yield and the shoot biomass. Um, prior to the start of the experiment, the algae biomass was characterized just to gain its elemental ratio. Um, so um, as you can see again, the, the, two, the fresh, the microalgae, spirulina and chlorella, had higher concentrations of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in their biomass in comparison to the seaweeds, particularly when you look at the phosphorus and the nitrogen especially. And when looking at the elemental ratios, all um, the, two, the two microalgae and two of the seaweeds all had elemental ratios, CN elemental ratios below um, 20, and we know that this governs the mineralization and decomposition rates in the soil. Uh, so the results for the greenhouse experiment first. Um, I got several results, but I've only chosen to show a few, and these were the ones which are the most uh, significant and also the most interesting. Um, so for soil available phosphorus, um, the algae was shown to, chlorella especially, was shown to increase soil available phosphorus concentrations by 38%, and under both under high application rates of the chlorella, um, and spirulina treatment, soil available phosphorus increased significantly in comparison to the control. And this again, this was expected because um, these two species had highest concentrations of phosphorus in their biomass initially. Uh, for soil available nitrogen concentrations, um, it increased under both under chlorella, which is the microalgae, and two of the seaweed treatments, 
and un that's under the three application rates, and these were significant, again, in comparison to the control. What was surprising was that um, the two seaweed treatments had um, lower concentrations, comparatively lower concentrations of nitrogen, total nitrogen in their biomass. However, they were able to contribute significantly to soil ammonium concentrations. So this could be more due to the CN ratios rather than the total elemental um, nutrient composition. Um, the soil water holding capacity, which is just an indication of the amount of soil in the water and uh, consequently the nutrients as well, um, showed that under high application rates of both um, microalgae, that's the chlorella and the spirulina, the water holding capacity increased significantly and under chlorella treatments was found to increase by 3.2%, um, which is quite huge. And um, so to not only test whether, so even though the algae had seemed to have some benefits on the soil physical properties, physical chemical properties. Um, uh, I tested, I looked at the impact on the yield and um, in terms of the impact on the shoot biomass, there was no significant results. However, chlorella did sh have an impact on increasing the pea yield um, in comparison to all the algae treatments. So despite all their benefits, chlorella was the one which had the ultimate result which we're looking for in, in, in terms of increasing the yield. Um, so. Yeah, I'll just summarize it at the end. So um, I did a, a conduct a parallel experiment in the field where I applied the same algae biomass and um, uh, in um, three using three replicates this time instead of four, which I used in a greenhouse experiment. And uh, just I also wanted to see whether this r results that we've seen obviously in the greenhouse were replicable in the field, and also to test whether um, how how the algae biomass was degraded in the soil. I took the me I took temporal measurements. So for soil available phosphorus, um, two weeks after the addition of algae biomass, concentrations decreased in the soil, and this is probably due to um, assimilation and immobilization by the microbes. And um, I have to say that none of the algae had any significant res um, differences. The, none of the algae significantly improved the soil available um, phosphorus concentrations, even though chlorella seemed to um, had high um, concentrations, it was not um, comparatively, comparatively different from the control, which was not what we saw in the greenhouse experiment. And for soil available nitrogen concentrations, both um, chlorella and after two, we two weeks after the addition, both chlorella and spirulina increased um, available ammonium nitrogen concentrations after two weeks. However, after eight weeks, um, Palmaria palmata, which is one of the seaweeds, the red algae, seemed to increase the ammonium nitrogen concentrations even more significantly. And this was similar to the results that we saw in the greenhouse experiment. And for soil nitrate nitrogen concentrations, um, again, spirulina and chlorella increased the nitrate nitrogen concentrations two weeks after. And after eight weeks, the, the concentrations decreased, and this was probably due to um, uptake by the plant. And soil aggregate stability was also measured. And here, um, the algae had absolutely no effect on soil aggregate stability, even though it seemed at one point that one of the seaweed species seemed to be performing better. There was no significant difference between any of the algae species in the end and the control. So basically, to summarize, um, the algae had no effects on soil aggregate stability in the field. Um, and also, there were no significant effects on soil phosphorus, con soil available phosphorus concentrations in the field experiment, even though um, the significant effects were observed in the greenhouse experiments. However, there was evidence of nitrogen mineralization occurring as a result of the algae addition. So, um, in the future, for future experiments, we're hoping to um, conduct more experiments to understand the impact of algae on soil nitrogen nutrient cycling and um, utilization by using stable isotope probing approaches. And also, immediate, more immediate future work is just to complete the analysis on wheat yield and grain micronutrient analysis to see whether there are also beneficial effects on um, the nutritional value of the wheat itself from the algae additions. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Really interesting work. Do we have any questions for Amanda? Sure. Um, you're using peas, which is presumably meant that they have nitrogen fixing in the algae. So, do you have any thoughts on whether maybe the nitrogen fixing in the algae treatment was directly the effect of adding nitrogen from the algae, or whether there was some kind of interaction going on with the nitrogen fixing bacteria? 
Um, yeah, I did consider that at some point that it could have been the case. However, from repeating the experiment again in the field with wheat, which doesn't have any nodules or rhizobia in it, I got almost exactly the same results. So, um, which just maybe confirms that maybe those the impact was more from the algae than from the nitrogen fixing rhizobia. Yeah. Just, just wondering, uh, do the do the cell walls of the algae does that affect its decomposition? Then? Like, I wonder if you nail the algae before you put it in the ground, does that make any difference? Like, does it decompose readily? Or um, I think it did make a difference. Um, I didn't highlight that fact, but one of the algae, um, Ascophyllum nodosum, has um, it's more it was more coarse, and also it has more um, alginins and more less readily decomposable um, polysaccharides in its cell wall, and hence it seemed to it looked like it wasn't performing as well. But however, it probably just took a longer time to degrade in comparison to the other ones, which were more fine and more soluble, hence were even mineralizable. So I think it did have an, an impact. So. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much once again. And now we're on to our final talk in this afternoon's session by Sarah Dalrymple talking about a chance for recovery from nutrient addition. So, thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so my talk today is on the site that I've got on my title slide, which is the Keen of Hammer on Shetland. And um, I'm, in, I'm in Liverpool at John Moores University now, but I was at Aberdeen for 10 years. and. Um, so it was, it was relatively accessible from Aberdeen. Um, it's a, a, an excellent ex example of serpentine. If you don't know what serpentine is, it's um, a soil which is very mineral dominated, has very low <coughs> organic matter, um, and tends to be, um, have very high levels of uh, heavy metals that are toxic to plant growth, and also uh, very low levels of the major uh, plant growth nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, potassium, and, and particularly calcium as well. So um, that and the fact that with the low organic matter, it's very um, drought prone, means it's, it's generally just a horrible place to be if you're a plant. Um, so we, we're, I've been involved in the last 10 years in this um, uh, study, um, generally looking at the rare plants on, on the Keen as well as the nutrient addition experiment I'm going to be talking about today. But David Slingsby, who's pictured there, he set up um, the experiments uh, in 1980, he started. Um, so it's a, it's a really great example of a long-running ecological um, data set. Okay, so Shetland is um, just high latitude, um, and our study site is on Unst, which is the furthest north, which gives us uh, extra credibility in terms of <laughs> latitudinal points. Um, and so, like I said, the, our site's called the Keen of Hamar, or Hammer, and um, this site, it, if you can just about see, uh, the, the debris habitat that we're particularly interested in has been greyed out. So it's a patchy um, habitat of these um, very mineral um, dominated uh, substrates and then um, I'll try not to black it out um, there's a boundary around here which is a triple SI boundary and it runs along this edge then um, around that there's um, pasture land for cattle grazing to the north and the south um, so, so the boundary along here but along the south of the site I'm just going to show you the next photo and it's the same boundary running here so we're looking east on this photo um, and what you can see, hopefully quite clearly, is that the serpentine debris is sort of interspersed in this view anyway by um, thicker soils where there's a, there's a heath vegetation on there and that's glacial drift soils. But the, the serpentine debris is a very skeletal soil with, with very little on it. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to highlight here is on the other side of the boundary, the improved pasture. Um, that was created by fertilising and seeding a bit of ground, ground that was obviously a continuation of what we can see there. So the farmer in the late 70s um, converted that into pasture land again for cattle. 
Um, and at about the same time, these experiments were set up partly to investigate the impacts of fertilisation and seeding and whether the, the ecosystem can recover, but also to try and test some of the hypotheses about why the debris has never been um, undergone pedogenesis, so soil formation, and and why why was it such a you know a denuded sort of landscape? So was it uh, nitrogen limitation or phosphorus limitation? Okay, so um, these are some of the things that we're interested in on the Keen. Um, I am a plant ecologist, and so looking at these montane things that grow, and, and you can see that they're they've got these white flowers but they're generally um, very low growing these are just a few centimeters tall these plants and you can also see the substrate is uh, pretty pretty horrible so it's just sort of gravelly um, uh, generally a, gra a sort of gravel and pebble matrix and then with all these heavy metals and things in it so the experiment um, was to look at nutrient addition the treatments were applied um, starting in 1980 um, and the, they were set up as a, a randomised block design. So we had um, the different nutrient combinations and a control that were permanently marked. Um, and these were set up in four blocks. So we had two blocks on sparsely vegetated debris and two blocks on more moderately vegetated debris. So there's a little bit of plant growth there, um, which you can see in the next photo. Uh, so, so obviously this is our sort of our quadrat. Um, but you can just about see that hopefully that there's a bit of plant growth around here. So this is moderately colonised um, debris. The stuff that's sparsely colonised just has virtually no plant growth at all. Um, and this quadrat, they're, they're doing pin frame quadrats. So after the, the treatments, the nutrient treatments were applied, we, we've, well, not me personally, <laughs> but over seven years across that sort of 32 year period, we've been back and done um, plant vegetation surveys using pin frame quadrats. So that gives us some quite nice data on the plant community and how it's responded to the different treatments. Um, so the first thing to note, um, especially if you, you can't see it so well, is that the green and red lines um, generally at the bottom of the, the uh, plots are the um, N is green and red is control. So we've got um, a general pattern where in terms of phosphorus limitation, we think that um, phosphorus limitation is a key mechanism as opposed to nitrogen limitation um, because we can see that there's increased species richness wherever we've got phosphorus um, additions rather than nitrogen. And the nitrogen compares very similarly to the control treatment which just got tap water. Um, the other thing to note is that there's a general increase uh, in species richness regardless of whether it is on sparsely vegetated vegetation or, um, or debris or moderately vegetated debris um, and that general increase um, peaks at 2010 before dipping again. So the general increase we, we think is probably because we've found in previous publications we've reported that there's been a, a gradual increase in um, the growing season on the Keen, so a, a general warming, um, so probably more plant growth. Um, but then this, this quite um, sharp decline in all our blocks um, that we think coincided with um, a particularly extreme drought event in early 2013 which would have um, uh, had quite an adverse effect on, on the important early few months um, of plant growth. So with increased plant um, species richness there's also a very similar pattern with increased plant productivity. So again the, the nitrogen and uh, control treatments Green and, green and red, the same as before, are generally much lower. And actually, in some of the plots, you can see that the, the difference between anything that's got phosphorus in it and anything that hasn't got phosphorus in it is much more pronounced. Um, but still, there's obviously something else going on because, well, we see the, the dip after um, 2006 in this case rather than 2010. So we think that there's uh, an interplay in not just phosphorus limitation, but also with um, climate conditions um, over the over the 32 year study period. Okay, so to unpick some of the um, patterns within the community composition, I've got a principal components analysis which shows that anything that the light blue and dark blue are the nitrogen and control um, treatments, and they're generally clustering in this bottom corner. Um, and then anything with uh, phosphorus in is showing a much greater amount of variation. So these uh, are the plots um, for all years. So if I add the time centroids, 
So that means that for every year that we did a study, you can, um, you can plot sort of like the, the mean point for that cloud of plots. Um, we can follow how the, the plots change over time. So we start in 1981 in that bottom corner, and then we, for the sparsely vegetated treatments anyway, they go to a peak around here at 2006, 2010. And then, really interestingly, all this, and these are dominated by Festuca grasses, they go back towards their original um, position in the ordination, at least sort of, you know, halfway-ish, um, by 2013, which was the last time um, I went and surveyed it. So we might say that, we, you know, if things carry on along that trajectory, that there might be a re return to the original community composition. And um, a slightly different pattern with moderately um, vegetated debris. In by 1984, so only three years after our first survey, we now have agrostis dominated plots up here. But then the, the trajectory of community composition goes through the, the early 90s and then to 2006 and 2010, so very similar to the, the sparsely vegetated um, plots in terms of community composition. And again, then a return in 2013 with a, with a possible future tra trajectory towards um, the original community composition. So, so some really interesting results in terms of um, not just phosphorus limitation, but um, possibly, um, or release of phosphorus limitation when we added phosphorus, but also possibly then phosphorus loss and reversion back to the original community. So um, I was quite interested in how the community might respond um, to, to these phosphorus additions and whether there was anything in the literature to say that people had seen um, similar effects. Um, so I looked at this paper by Dwyer et al, which is on a, an Australian very arid system along a gradient of uh, moisture availability and nitrogen in their case. And I wanted to see whether the, the keen um, plant communities were responding in a similar way. So, so they were looking at moisture availability and supply of limiting nutrients and they found various gradients for species richness from high, where moisture availability is very high, but the nutrients are very low. Um, whereas we found uh, a general sort of increase where, where we think there might be more moisture availability and more nutrients, um, then there's uh, a, a movement from low species richness to high species richness. In terms of number of e exotics, um, I counted um, uh, exotics to mean the non-serpentine specialists, and um, in that case, we our results agree with theirs that we get more exotics with higher moisture availability and higher limiting nutrients. Um, but then, in terms of the um, community trait range, they they predicted and they showed that the community trait range in terms so the, the community trait range means that if your community has a very narrow trait range then the, the species tend to be quite uh, selected for a particular set of conditions. The broader they get the more sort of generalist and variable the community is. Um, and they showed that um, there's a transition that you have um, very narrow community um, sort of trait range where both things are limiting. But then they, it becomes narrow again where moisture availability and the nutrient availability is, um, is much better. Um, and I thought, well, actually, we've probably shown this because um, I looked at the Ellenberg values. Oops. The Ellenberg values for um, moisture. So that if you don't know, Ellenberg values are a way of sort of, um, of ranking the tolerance and describing the tolerance uh, of different plant species to different environmental gradients. And so I found that the variation, as shown by the standard deviation around the mean at community level, at plot level, increased during our study um, period and then decreased again um, towards uh, 2013, our last survey. So that sort of agrees with their, um, their idea that um, we have narrow trait range that broadens and then narrows again when moisture availability and phosphorus, um, in our case, uh, becomes more available. But um, given our other line of evidence, our community composition that shows a reversion back to uh, former community, um, I thought that actually it was probably more likely that we were going from narrow community trait range um, and then returning back to that. Because we're seeing a reversion of the community composition and um, towards the sort of the things that are more tolerant to serpentine debris and the general arid and nutrient poor conditions. And that's, uh, that means that environmental filtering, according to Dwyer et al's scheme, is still the most important um, driver of uh, community change, 
or uh, community status. Um, and rather than it being competitive exclusion, which we might see if, if um, the plots had been dominated by the, the Festuca or Agrostis grasses and that had excluded everything, then we would have seen a similar uh, narrowing of the trait range. So, um, so overall, um, I was thinking about this in terms of, well, you know, in terms of going back to that field that the farmer fertilised and seeded, is there any potential for recovery or is that a, a permanent um, change in community type in, in terms of uh, it being a, a stable state? Um, so this sort of scheme uh, that I've shown here is to show that the community went from being one sort of community type and by adding phosphorus we release that limitation on the community and the, the community um, changed from a debris community into a heath community but then probably things like the um the very severe drought um conditions um well they're showing that the climate is also operating on this system it's not just about phosphorus limitation and that instead of it being a trajectory up to another um stable state we're probably getting a reversion or a return to um the to the the debris community that characterizes um, these soils so hopefully that shows um, the, the potential of the system to recover. Of course, these were just one-off additions, and so um, we don't know if, if they are repeated, then does that um, consolidate that, and, and then it, the, the systems can't recover. But it does mean that there's um, very great potential for losses in the future, because if the climate continues to ameliorate, so it's, be, it's becoming warmer, the growing season's extending, um, and... Um, and if phosphorus becomes more available through being neighbouring to the farms and everything, then that might mean that we, we have more losses in the future. Okay, so my final slide is just to say thanks to, um, we over the 30 year period, obviously I wasn't involved the whole time, but David has been involved in the whole time. Um, and um, we've had very, very many um, volunteers over the, over the time to help us collect all this data. And also to say thanks to the British Ecological Society and Scottish Natural Heritage who have funded various of our expeditions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Sarah. Um, that does bring our session to an end. We are at our time limit now. Coming up next downstairs is the poster session. So that'll be a really good opportunity to see what else is happening and also to talk to some of our speakers that we maybe didn't have as much time for questions with. Um, also, don't forget about all the SIG social events happening this evening. There's a lot of really good stuff going on. So hopefully you'll be able to join in. And thanks for putting up for my, with my impromptu last minute taking over of the chairing this session. <laughs> um, thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't, uh, it was supposed to be Alan Jones, but his car was broken and all stuff. So I, so I heard, I literally had just come out of a workshop. I went to the college and asked to come up out. Make sure the picture is there. Very much for having me. Well, thank you so much for stepping in this minute. Yeah. And you had like all the guests. And they've got a gigantic room now, haven't they? And here, this room, this morning, was packed. No, it was um, ecology and ecosystems, like novel approach. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to know. I don't have to yeah. I don't remember anything. But yeah, thank you for thank you for thank you for It's always I use our company was just so much of the things to go around usually. No, no, that's it, yeah. But your session ran. I mean, some of the places don't even have
if you say something that they have, yeah, and then you just remind people when they are Yeah, because not everyone is like, yeah, it's very important. It's not like you can do that. Yeah, it's very important. 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 Yeah, it's